looking at the development of youth and student politics in the country. Now, our guest author is Riho Tsofet Chikane, and he wrote a game-changing book that he titled Breaking a Rainbow, Building a Nation. This offering reflects on first-hand accounts of the university protects, uh, you know, that, that swam South Africa, or protest rather, that swam South Africa between the years 2013 and 2017. Rechotsofetze is joining us now via Skype to help dissect the current nature of South Africa's youth politics. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, the book has been out for quite some time now. Briefly remind us what the book is about and why you wrote it. So the book is an account of my experiences of not just the protests that happened in 2015 and 2016, but the nature of changing youth politics in the country. So I try and take the read on this journey, quite a personal one as well, starting with my own enlightenment, my own thinking about the notion of what it means to be young, black in South Africa, what does it mean to enjoy these freedoms, whilst also not everyone in the country can enjoy these freedoms, and trying to weave a story that kind of explains the logic that informed the chaos and the chaos that informed the logic of the protest, that it wasn't something that kind of just happened overnight but was something that was actually building in the country for a good 20 years at that point. And with a little bit of luck, with certain moments happening at particular times, allowed us to have a platform to really start voicing a sense of change, not just in universities, but a deeper criticism about what is the state of our country right now. And I think that was kind of the purpose of the book. And the logic of it was, if we weren't writing our own story, someone else would write it on our behalf. Um, and I thought that would be that would be a horrible way for someone to tell the story of these must fall or roads must fall or just the general youth politics of the country at the time from the perspective of someone who didn't go through it. So I thought there is a responsibility on us to write our own stories. And fast forward to the post-2017 academic years. How has the fees must fall movement impacted the schooling system? So you see the impact in multiple ways, right? Most people think about the protests and wondering, did you get that 0% fee increment or did you get that free education? But if you remember the entire demand, it was for free decolonized education. So what you're starting to see is an increase of universities attempting to re-look at their curriculums, re-look at the structure of that university, re-look at how students experience that university space. So there's that one aspect. The second aspect is that the discussion of fees has now fundamentally changed in the sense of the negotiations are now a lot more balanced. Before 2015, any discussion about fees was more akin to the university telling you what a fee number would be, a fee increase would be, and you having to accept that. And I think now there's a general understanding that that is an unsustainable financial model, both for the university, but also more so for the livelihoods of the most marginalized students on campus. Right, so there is a new cognizant idea of that. And lastly, the aspect of free education is now slowly but surely filtering its way throughout the education system or higher education system. And I think that's a win. Now, we do need to pay attention to the eventual full-on rollout of it and that it doesn't get masked as a grant acting like it is free education. But I think there have been tangible changes. However, there's still a lot more that can be done. Right. You still can't have a situation where students will go to class at the beginning of the year and not have a place to sleep and have to sleep in their lecture halls. So there's still progress to be made, but I think the gains that we have made in the past were still really good. And uh, what kind of influence do you think uh, this book has had on how we look at the youth today and the student politics in this country? So I, <laughs> it might be a bit of a bold statement to be like, it's influenced people's minds, but I hope it is. it has brought some sort of light uh, to people's understanding of an inevitability in the country. And, and the inevitability that I talk, in the, in the, uh, talk about in the book is, if you don't change the current status quo of the country, right? if you maintain the current economic system, the current social system, what you're inadvertently doing is creating a lost generation of young South Africans, right? And I try and make the argument in the book that I particularly don't want to become the sacrificial lamb of the country's failed economic project, right? And if you don't solve that situation, if you don't solve the structural issues, these must fall will be the least of our concerns. There will be something else that emanates out of it, another rise of some sort. 
And I think that's the type of warning that I want readers to take, that changing the structural elements of our society, of our economy, has to become not just an imperative, but I believe a moral imperative of every young South African in this country. And uh, just picking up on that point of, uh, you know, changing the structural elements of our society and the economy, I mean, just looking at where we are right now as a country and the continent, uh, what are some of the topical issues relating to the youth that should be prioritised at the moment? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a well-known triple-headed factor of unemployment, poverty and inequality, right? Um, add into that gender-based violence. And this is not just South Africa. This is across the continent, right? And at that point, you're asking the question of how do you survive in a situation where you're unemployed, mm. you don't have a job, I mean, you don't have a job, you're stuck in poverty, you're stuck in this inequality trap, this gender-based violence and gender-based discrimination. You then have to ask the question of what type of planet are we inheriting? I was making a joke with a friend a couple of days ago that at least in South Africa, as a young person, we have no idea what an economic boom even feels like. But we've never experienced times where economic hardship weren't a, norm weren't a normal aspect of our society. And I think that's the African continent as a whole, that we're starting to ask these questions of if the majority of people on this planet are young people, and the majority of people on the continent are young people, but it's the type of planet that we're inheriting. And I think those questions are becoming more and more important for us. All right, Rahul Sofa, it's a great chatting to you, man. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. There we go. That was uh, Ri Hosofe Tsuchikane, and he's been speaking to us about the youth politics in this country as well as how he outlines them in his first published book, Breaking a Rainbow, Building a Nation. It is uh, 7.48.